In January 2004, Florilegium, together with the Bolivian Pro Art and Culture Foundation, APAC, organized auditions to select soloists who would sing the vocal parts of the music to be recorded. Florilegium's director flew to Bolivia several times in order to match the singers with the ensemble. Last April, Florilegium, together with the four Bolivian singers and Chan classics, traveled to the small village of Concepcion in the Amazonian region of Bolivia to take part in a unique music festival with world premiere performances. Here they would be recording for Channel Classics works that were selected by Piotr Navrut, the musicologist and musical director of APAC. Piotr Navrut is a Polish priest who has worked in Bolivia for many years editing and reconstructing these lost works. Rediscovered Baroque music of Bolivia, performed by Floridigium with Bolivian soloists.
when I travel, I always take some music with me. And, and well, if I see, uh, you know, musicians, uh, uh, I approach and I talk to them and I do everything to get them interested in this music. The relationship with Bolivia came about because uh, Piotr Navrot was in London and came to a concert that Florilegium were giving. <laughs> I enjoyed very much the musical production and during the intermission I said well I have to go to this guy who is playing on the organ and talk to him no? uh, how much I enjoy this production but ask him also do you know something about uh, Baroque music from Bolivia. We exchanged our cards and then maybe a couple of weeks later I've written the first letter and I sent it to music. And I received this wonderful email back from Piotr almost immediately saying that you have to come to the festival in Bolivia, this music needs to be heard in Bolivia. Um, so in 2002 we came to the festival. It's a festival that mainly involves um, North and South American ensembles and for the first time they invited an English group to take part in the festival. Our festival uh, demands that every, every musical ensemble coming to Bolivia must include in their program at least five to ten minutes of Bolivian Baroque music. And what was remarkable about the festival in 2002 is we were playing in the middle of the jungle in some of these missions. And when we played this piece of Bolivian Baroque music, you could hear the audience um, get incredibly excited at the fact that here is a European group playing their music. I got really very pleased with this interpretation. And from this relationship with Piotr, the, um, the project developed because I said to him, you know, None of this music is ever played in London. You really never hear chamber music and music with singers in London performing music from the archives in Bolivia. And I said I would be very interested in putting on a concert in London's Wigmore Hall um, just of Bolivian Baroque music. And a very close friend of mine is Emma Kirkby, who's a famous soprano. I said I will invite Emma to sing some of the big arias because that way we would guarantee that there'd be a lot of interest in England. So we started to dream. Well, how about if you take not only five to ten minutes, but the entire program? How about if you do recording of this music? So we decided to put a programme of Bolivian Baroque music in London and see what the response would be like. So last year um, I invited Emma Kirkby to join Florilegium in the Wigmore Hall of a programme purely of Bolivian Baroque music. And in order to um, select the programme I received I think nearly 30 kilograms of music in the post to, to siphon off um, a programme that would be useful to have for an audience in London. And the concert was incredibly successful. Um, I think the Wigmore Hall said they could have sold the concert twice over on consecutive nights. And after that project, I wanted to take it further and said, well, you know, maybe um, we could get Channel Classics to record a, pro a project of this music on the label. Um, but we wanted to have it with a much more Bolivian flavour and so an idea was to find four Bolivian singers who could actually sing as a consort on the CD. I studied philosophy and theology and after ordination I was sent to Latin America. I was working in this pastoral ministry, but on the side I was also looking for sacred music. Uh, for the first time in the context of Paraguay, I have seen the ruins of the former Jesuit reductions. Uh, reductions, that's exactly the same like saying Jesuit former missions. And you know, what I, I have seen, it was really splendid. So I asked myself, and what about music? 
because it cannot be that you have a wonderful architecture and painting and suddenly music is missing. And later on, studying, studying for my doctorate, I, I have chosen as a topic of my dissertation music from the Jesuit reductions. Uh, at that time, uh, Hans Roth, who was the architect who restored most of the churches which we can enjoy today, um, he was the first one to write an article that there is some music in the Bolivian context, music which was written in the, by the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century. So I went down from the United States to meet Hans Roth, to meet uh, you know, uh, uh, original uh, Americans, and to start working on this manuscript. There aren't very many Bolivian singers in Europe. In fact, I know of no Bolivian singers who are working in Europe. And so, um, with the help of the Prince Class Foundation, I was flown out to Bolivia in January this year, 2004, to hold auditions. And they flew in um, anybody who could basically sing um, from around the country in Bolivia. We started to look for these singers, to look for these soulists. And that's the way this work with the help of uh, uh, the Prince Klaus Foundation, Don Foundation, and so on, and mainly with friends, people like us that are in love with music, that are in love, in love with this project. That's the way this project started. There were all sorts of um, standards of singers who arrived. Some couldn't read music, some knew the pieces that we were uh, working through purely by heart because they'd heard them through, throughout their life as part of church services. We've been there, three of us, selecting the best of the Bolivian voices. We were, we were chosen by the director Ashley Solomon uh, to make four, uh, four people, uh, soprano, contralto, tenor and bass. And we were working on that with different sopranos, with different tenors, and he decided to to have those singers and the three sopranos and yeah. And I discovered four very good singers as part of this um, um, audition process in January. As soon as the Bolivian singers became involved, it was clear that they had a natural affinity with the music that I think you can only have if you've grown up and lived and breathed this music all your life. It was something which gave a new air to the entire project. But the problem was that none of these singers had ever sung Baroque music before. Um, and this was in January, and within four months we were planning to record a CD in the middle of the jungle in Bolivia. With the help of the Prince Klaus Foundation, I returned to Bolivia, I guess every month, for a week of coaching with these four singers to try and get them to um, take on board a lot more about the Baroque style of interpretation, which was completely new to them, something they hadn't done before. For the Bolivian singers, or being on one production together with Florilegium, it is like giving them wings to fly very high and to learn a lot. Actually, I used to play in the guitar Baroque music, Renaissance music. That is the reason that I uh, fell, in, fell in love in Baroque music, in early music especially. And I, th I feel the Baroque music uh, comes to my blood, I, I think. I, I feel, and um, their uh, especially details gave me Rodrigo del Pozo, and and it was fantastic work with uh, Ashley Solomon, who's as a spe specialist. And they were incredibly fast learners. The main soprano came to London to have lessons with Emma Kirkby and Jennifer Smith, and the tenor who had um, some solo pieces went to Chile to study with Rodrigo del Pozo. Yes, uh, thanks to the uh, Principal Klaus fund, fund, Foundation and APAC, I went to Chile to have some classes with Rodrigo del Pozo. And it was my first classes and it was the beginning of my dream. Everyone was on this train to make it happen.
Concepcion, where today we have the biggest collection of the musical manuscripts of the 18th century, was just a small village. Today this manuscript uh, is uh, as rich as uh, a collection of music uh, of 5,500 pages. And this is a complete repertoire of sacred music which was uh, applied for the life of the community. In every mission, you know, they would have such a repertoire of the mostly Baroque music. Uh, this rep repertoire consists of masses, polyphonic masses, of uh, sacred operas, of vespers, of motets, instrumental music, and music for keyboard. So we're talking about something really complete. Uh, most of this music was written in the missions. Who wrote this music? That's still a question. I strongly believe that a good part of this music was written by local composers. In every little town, they would have 30 to 40 professional musicians working for the church and for the community. And they would play for the mass every day. And for the major religious festivals, music would be a part of every single moment of the celebration. In the morning, they would have a splendid polyphonic mass with every single part sung by the professional musicians and by the priests. In every community, you would have like four to 5,000 Indians and two or three Europeans, all of them priests or two priests and one brother. But the musicians would be only the Indians, prepared in a music school, selected from the community very early in their life. They would be like seven or eight of age, no? and uh, someone who would display talent in music would be selected and sent to the music school, and this education would last for years eight, ten, even more years, and they would be trained in playing on musical instruments. They would be trained also in uh, uh, singing, and they would be trained in making musical instruments. And uh, several of them would be trained also in dance. Professionals, they would play a very splendid mass in the morning, then in the afternoon they would play also the Vesper service at night, they would produce also a sacred opera. So this is this collection from Concepcion, 5,500 pages of music, mostly written by the Indian composers. One of the main objectives of APAC is to spread this music all over the world. One of the ways to make this known is through uh, important groups like Florilegium. When Florilegium went the, the first time to Bolivia, I think they fall in love with this music, they fall in love with the place, they fall in love with the objectives of a pack. I would say that the most important point in uh, restoration of this music was the creation of the music festival. A group of friends in Santa Cruz today called APAC, which is Association for Art and Culture in Santa Cruz, in a given point decided to call the first festival and to invite people to uh, play Latin American Renaissance and Baroque music. APAC decided to call this festival every two years. For the first festival, we had only seven musical ensembles coming to Bolivia and interpreting this music. But we also wanted to have one musical ensemble from the missions. So, aside of the festival, another project began, forming musical schools in the Bolivian jungle, the way it was done in the 17th and 18th century. In every given place, they do three, four, or even five different programs of music, of Baroque music, every year. 
and what they play is mostly this repertoire from the two archives. Then most of the violins which they play should be produced in Bolivia because in Bolivia there are three major centers for the violin production, one in Rubicea, one in Mojos and one in Chiquitos. Uh, so uh, employing our uh, people we can give them also a job. But what is very important is also that the wood which is used to, for the violin production is from the local material because the sound changes a little bit. The way the festival is organized, it is that in Santa Cruz we have two concerts every day. And uh, people coming to the concert in Santa Cruz must pay a low fee for the concert, but going to the mission. And we have 12 different places in the mission when we organize these concerts. Concerts are for free. The reason for this is to invite as many people as possible. And the result is that enjoying this uh, good musical production, uh, local children, they get interested in making this music and they get also a good pattern how to do it. In our music schools, we have also uh, kids playing on almost all of these musical instruments. Uh, we have a number of people playing on violins, cellos, uh, but also oboe, flute, uh, also you know percussion instruments, keyboards, and uh, what is also uh, very uh, much a part of our project is that, you know, this Baroque music will not cause any damage to the autochthonous music. It should be the way it was in the 17th and 18th century. So several of those kids, you know, they learn not only Baroque music, but they learn also, you know, in a proper way, uh, the autochthonous music. And they play on autochthonous uh, instruments too. Uh, so both of these, it is a tradition. And for the festival, that's the same story. Next to the musical manuscript, what we have also in Bolivia, is this continuous tradition. Baroque in the Bolivian context is not something about the past. It is something which still was preserved to, the, to this very day, to our days. And what we need to do, we need to record also the local ensembles because we still have choir of old women singing in Latin or singing in Chiquitano or Mojo language, old songs which you cannot find in the musical score. We still have musical ensembles playing the, old, the, the, the very old way. We still have some of the you know, historical instruments uh, we have some of the instruments made in the 19th century and some made in the 20th century. We should never forget that violins were built in Bolivia until, until these very days. Even if today we would consider this as a very imperfect you know, copy, but you know, not to let this tradition die, they would keep making these instruments.
When Ashley made his first phone call to me saying that there was a possibility of going to Bolivia, my enthusiasm quickly turned into panic. Very simply, how do I get all my equipment there? How do I get it all back? 250 kilograms of equipment. Not only microphones, but the mixing board, super audio, converters going from analog to digital and back, hard drives, computers, uh, quite a bit of stuff that just, you know, is not around the corner. And the other panic being, when I f finally get to this Amazon area, my God, I hope I have all my cables with me. Didn't forget anything. So we arrived in Bolivia um, at the end of April this year, together with um, Channel Classics, and set up our base in the um, church in Concepcion in the middle of the jungle, which is, I guess, a six-hour drive from Santa Cruz, which is one of the major towns in Bolivia. So it really is in the middle of nowhere. One of the parts I did not bring with me was the speakers. So I had arranged with the uh, festival in Bolivia to have some speakers arranged, five speakers, that is. And the, the best quality was promised, but unfortunately, when we finally got to this church in Concepcion, the speakers that were delivered, which um, unfortunately would have been much better in a football stadium than for a recording of classical music, and uh, had to depend just on a simple set of headphones. And the church is a remarkable building built in 1707 and restored um, with a wonderful acoustic. Um, but not set up for recording uh, as a recording venue for the 21st century um, recording company. So we had all, all sorts of problems we had to cope with. All the birds, all the scooters. Uh, the scooters actually we were able to solve by having the local police and army completely uh, cut off the church and from the surroundings so that nobody could get near the church during recording sessions. And it was rather difficult to tell the chief of police to get off his motorcycle and not drive around the church whenever he felt. And for the birds, yeah, we had to record in the middle of the night. We were given free reign of the church, which meant we could record till the middle of the night, which we did, I think, on the second day to, to finish some of the pieces in the, in, the, in the dead of night. It was a big challenge, but I, try, I prepared myself, I think, for two or three months after, the, after taking class with Rodrigo del Pozo. Um, uh, I think it was pretty good. Among the Chiquito missions, 10 churches were built during the time of the Jesuit presence, and the Cathedral of Concepcion is a good example of the structure of the mission church. In the center, you would have a main altar and in the center of the altar, the patron saint of the village. And because this is a Concepcion, so we can see the Virgin Mary in the center. Then, in two lateral naves, you would have also two uh, lateral altars. Probably the theme of the uh, Passion would be emphasized. So on one side, you would have Jesus on the cross, and on the other si side, his suffering mother. Then, um, uh, the material which was used to build the churches was mostly adobe and also wood. It was very easy to get wood uh, from, the, from the, uh, the jungle which surrounds the, the village. In front of the church, you would have uh, bells and the tower. Uh, in every tower you would have at least seven bells, but it could, it could go as far as 18 bells, and it was very elaborated, seldom ever together with the church, quite often just a, few, uh, a small distance from the church. And the bells were used to call people for the prayer, but also to send messages for a great distances. Then the material which was very often used to paint the churches was uh, got from the, from the jungle. So the painting would use a very natural uh, uh, paintings and all, everything was done by the local people. Because of this, you can enjoy some spectacular uh, ornaments quite often relating the decoration 
uh, to the decoration taken from the jungle. What is also very important here is to remember that even the, if those churches were built by the Jesuits, the restoration was done by the Franciscans. Uh, so this is a, truly a missionary spirit, uh, the inclusion and collaboration and mutual enrichment. From a technical point of view, we had to find a room where Jared and I could sit and actually record. The room that I was staying in, with all my equipment, was up a very steep flight of stairs. Being under the roof of the church was 40 degrees. And so we had, we had these helpers build us a room um, with some wooden frames and they stitched together alpaca blankets just under the roof of the church, which is where Jared and I sat to, to produce the CD. Um, the major problem was that in Bolivia at this time of year it was about 70-80 degrees Fahrenheit um, during the day and the sun um, came down on the roof of the church and heated it up so we were practically working in a sauna um, condition. The alpaca blankets that had been so carefully stitched together meant it got incredibly hot um, in there. But we managed and we took regular breaks and um, remarkably we recorded the CD in three days. Let's go have some lunch. Well done, everyone. That's what? One, five, one. Yeah. Okay. Eligio, I want my pencil back. Uh, I suggest we start again about half past three-ish. Remarkably, we recorded the CD in three days. I say remarkably because until we arrived at the hotel in Santa Cruz. Apart from myself, nobody else in Florilegium had met the four singers who were working with us. And the relationships were developed and built very, very quickly. And after two very long days of rehearsal, um, things came together remarkably quickly, which is unique, actually, for a, a project like this, where the two parties come together um, with no notice almost. The four singers um, that I chose for this project have different assets to bring to the project. Um, the most, in fact, most of the so big solo arias are for soprano and discovered the most wonderful soprano, Katia Escalera, who, um, whose technique is remarkable. Um, and there was almost nothing she was struggling with technically. Um, I'm very open to interpretation and style and understanding and she worked quite hard with Emma Kirkby in London on a number of the arias that Emma sang with us at the Wigmore Hall um, last year. And 
she is, uh, has been a tremendous help for the project in Bolivia because the singers have been working together as a consort under her direction when I'm not there. Um, and she, she has studied in America, so she's been outside Bolivia. And I think we'll have a tremendous career in Europe if she chooses to take it. The next singer is Henry, who um, is quite a remarkable character um, and very Bolivian in many, many respects in his character and in his personality. Um, and for him, it's, it's a roller coaster ride, this whole project. He can't quite believe um, that it's A, happening to him, and that B, he's now in Europe taking lessons and um, living in Amsterdam for a few, a few months and really getting a taste of what it's like to, to be working and studying in Europe. And the two other female singers, um, uh, one is a high soprano, Ale Alejandra, um, has a wonderful pure voice. Um, she is gaining in experience all of the time and, um, and is, is developing tremendously as a singer. And the more involved she gets in this music and project, the, the more exceptional I think her talent is. And the final singer, Giancarla Tissera, is, um, has a lovely low mezzo voice, although she is also a soprano, but has a, a wonderful range and is able to sing the, the alto and mezzo roles in this project. Um, and again, she's actually studying in, in North America, but um, spends most of her life in Bolivia when she's not studying. So again, she has had her eyes open slightly wider to, to what life is like outside of Bolivia and, um, and is able to support the consort in the fact that she, she produces this beautiful low register. And they get on so tremendously well as a consort, which is unusual for a group of four singers. Um, but I think they're their tradition and, and the way they grew up is, is very similar, all four of them, although they grew up in different parts of Bolivia. And the, their connection and their love for this Bolivian music is clear in the way they sing it. And that's what makes this project unique. As I said, the relationship with the singers developed to a, to a wonderful degree, uh, to the point where we were having jamming sessions with um, our guitarist, double bass player, and the tenor who plays sequels, which are Bolivian pan pipes. So in periods when we were resting or having time off from recording and rehearsing, they would just um, jam in the church, which was wonderful. And so that also helped the feeling of, um, um, of unity for this project, the fact that we were, you know, not only working incredibly hard together, but when we were having time off, we were still making music, a different sort of music. Um, and, and Henry was teaching the others um, traditional Bolivian tunes, which they picked up and had a great time with, which was fantastic. Playing and have a performance with Florida Age was fantastic. It was my first time recording, it was my first experience that I had. It was amazing, it was incredible. I don't have any, uh, a lot of words to say that. How was incredible was it? Since coming back to Holland, Ashley Solomon and I have been sitting here quite a number of times putting all the different sessions together. Being Super Audio, it does have a lot more work entailed to get all the different versions from stereo and a multi-channel. And of course, working with singers who had never done a recording before. So we are extremely happy with the results of this recording. We're almost finished with all the editing, and yet we're already speaking about going back to Concepcion, because Piotr has been reconstructing a lot more music of liturgical and instrumental works, and uh, even doing an opera that he's discovered. We're all looking forward to the possibility of going back to Concepcion in Bolivia. My dream would be also that uh, Florilegium as an instrumental ensemble would also uh, perform several of the instrumental sonatas which we have in both archives, Chiquitos and Mojos. Eventually, 
I would like also for a legend as an instrumental ensemble accept several of the uh, Bolivian musicians who play on instrumental, uh, instrumental music or who are instrumentalists. Uh, I believe that only when we have these two bodies together we will achieve our goal. Baroque music from Latin America is quite similar to the Baroque music from Europe, but not identical. And several of the local instruments must be added to make the sound really Latin American. So uh, the local element should be always present, and then the sound will be like a mission Baroque. We're doing all we can, you know, to make this recording as a point of departure, but not as a point of arrival. I'll never forget that uh, I do, I have done concerts with them. <laughs>